Hello, welcome to everyone who's already joined incredibly promptly. I can see we've got lots of attendees already, which is brilliant. Just to say we'll be getting started in a few moments just to give everyone a chance to join. Hello, welcome if you've just joined us. We're just giving everyone a couple of moments to join. We've got well over 100 of you on the line already, which is fantastic. We'll, we'll just give it another minute for people to join and get settled and then we'll get going. Okay, welcome everyone. We've got already more than 120 people. The numbers keep flying up. So thank you so much for giving up your time today. Um, my name is Cordelia. I'm an associate partner at Britain Thinks, the insight and strategy consultancy. We're really proud and excited to work with Dot Everyone on this brilliant project. Um, on today's webinar, we're going to give you a flavour of the research findings from the report. And we're going to talk a little bit about the implications of those findings, as well as giving you an opportunity to ask questions about the research and also share your own observations and thoughts about what the findings mean for society, for the technology industry and for government and regulators. Um, so we have a fantastic lineup of speakers today who I'm going to hand over to very shortly. Um, I'm firstly going to hand over to my brilliant colleague uh, Max Templer, who's an Associate Director at Britain Thinks, who is just going to talk you through firstly the research methodology we uh, adopted for this research, um, including the very interesting challenge that the qualitative fieldwork took place um, on day two and three of lockdown. Um, so he's just going to share, along with the research method, a few observations about how you even go about conducting research in the context of a global pandemic. He's also just going to share a few very high level uh, findings from our other research on how the general public is dealing with coronavirus, what the public mood is at the moment and what that seems to mean in terms of how people are thinking about technology. Once we've heard from Max, he's going to hand over to Catherine Miller, who is interim CEO at Dot Everyone and the author of the fantastic report, I think so many of you will have read already. Um, she's going to give a high level overview of the key research findings that you might have read about or have yet to read. Um, and then we're going to go to um, our two special guests. Uh, firstly, to Tabitha Goldstab, who is co-founder of COGX, and chair of the AI Council um, and she is going to give a couple of minutes response thinking particularly about how industry might need to respond to some of the findings set out in this report. Uh, she'll only have a couple of minutes so I'm, going, I'm going to be very bossy on time because I want to make uh, sure there's lots of opportunity for questions from you all. Um, then we'll go to Roger Taylor um, who, when I was looking up the exact titles of speakers, um, I have learned is not the drummer from Queen, but much more relevantly and more excitingly, Chair of the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation. I'm going to ask him to respond for a couple of minutes, particularly from the perspective of government and regulators and how they need to be responding to the findings from this report. Then, most importantly, it's over to all of you. So we'll then go to a QA and a um, and go to some of the questions that you've had, but also if you've had observations about the research that you want to share, uh, we'll discuss those um, as well. So just in terms of the tech and how it all works, we've elected to use Zoom, which in and of itself created a kind of quandary in terms of technology. What was the best uh, platform to use that struck the best balance between uh, 
privacy and usability, but we know many people are using Zoom at the moment and are quite familiar with how it works. But just in case uh, you need a quick refresher, um, at the bottom of your screen, you should see a few options. So it should say um, chat, Q&A on the left, chat and raise hand. And we want to draw your attention to the Q&A button in particular. So that's where you can submit questions or observations um, as the discussion continues today. And I encourage you to do that from the very start. The earlier you submit your question, the more likely it's going to get answered today. And we're hoping for lots of questions. So keep them coming thick and fast. You can type them in on the Q&A function. If you'd rather be anonymous, then you can submit your question anonymously. So just to make you aware, if you do write a question, others will be able to see it, but you don't have to have your name associated with that if you don't want to. Um, if you have any technical questions, then please let us know um, and you can do that via the chat function. So let's keep that separate from the questions we want to discuss later on. If there's a problem where you can't see the screen or anything like that, then please um, ask that via the chat function and my colleague will assist you. Um, final thing I wanted to make you aware of is that we are recording today's session, so you're hopefully aware of that when we mentioned that in the invitation. That's because we've had so much interest that some people who couldn't make the session today wanted to be able to catch up with it later. But do not fear, none of you as attendees are on the screen today, and, and I'm conscious it's still sort of lunchtime, so if you're munching away on a sandwich, don't worry, you're not going to come suddenly flying up on the screen. So you're totally anonymous. Um, and if you want to ask a question anonymously, you'll, then you won't have your name associated with the recording in any way. So I feel like I've talked for long enough. I'm going to hand over to uh, Max now, who's going to give a brief overview of the methodology from this research, what it's like to do research in the time of coronavirus, and how the general public are feeling at the moment. Over to you, Max. Hello everyone, sorry for the slight delay there. Um, so, um, so just to take you through firstly, uh, as Cordelia said, the methodology that we used for this piece of research and some of the fairly unique challenges that we, we faced um, with the lockdown being called. So we used a, a mixed methods approach for this piece of research, beginning with a quantitative survey. Uh, so that survey was conducted between the 25th of February to the 1st of March, so back before the lockdown was, was announced. Uh, that had a nationally representative uh, sample of 2,157 adults aged 18 plus, and, and then we had a boost on Scottish respondents up to 1,023. Uh, the results were then weighted to be representative of the adult UK population. So, as we said, that happened before the lockdown. However, the qualitative part of the research, which was aiming to really dig into detail and understand some of the findings that we'd kind of uncovered from that quant part of the work, uh, were due to happen on days two and three of the lockdown, uh, which presented obviously some pretty big challenges in terms of the approach that we took. So originally, we were going to be doing face-to-face -face focus groups. Uh, we changed that approach to then do online mini groups which we conducted, so four of those in England, and four of those in Scotland, and those groups were then split by age, gender, and socioeconomic grade. So that online approach uh, enabled us to still reach the same number of, of, of people, but obviously without um, having to go travel around the country or bring people together unnecessarily. That brings us on to the kind of question of how we're conducting qualitative research uh, in the, contact, the context of the lockdown. So the first point, and I think probably unsurprisingly, is that our field work uh, is now being conducted exclusively remotely, so by phone as well as online. So we are using online methods with audiences who are more confident in their ability to use kind of the internet, their devices and things like that, but still using phone interviews, so tele-depth interviews with audiences who might be less confident, less able to use platforms like Zoom or Microsoft Teams or things like that. The second thing that we found actually is that response rates and uptake are better than they they really ever have been. Uh, we're seeing that in the context where people aren't able to go off and do things in the evening the same way that they were used to. People are actually really looking for activities, things to do, as well as kind of really in 
taking the opportunity to earn some money for incentives and things like that. And so that's enabled us to reach some really difficult to reach groups, people who may be slightly harder to get into focus groups than usually. We're also seeing that some people, particularly younger people, seem to be even more open and honest than they might be face to face. People are increasingly obviously used to communicating with one another online via online platforms uh, and even seeing in some cases some of that kind of quasi anonymity which can express itself in less uh, kind of pleasant ways and platforms like uh, well with things like trolling that actually is enabling us to really understand people's perspectives on some topics that they may be less likely to discuss face to face. Um, however it is worth saying that some aspects of online research obviously proving more challenging or presenting some challenges um, compared to doing research face to face. So unlike doing focus groups uh, in person, things like kind of body language, being able to see the whites of people's eyes, it's a little bit more difficult and makes managing conversations different than it would be in those situations. To kind of aim off for those things, we're using kind of smaller group sizes. So how we did for this, this piece of research to make sure that we can hear from everyone who's taking part in the groups we're also keeping those groups fairly homogenous to ensure that those conversations are really cohesive and making sure that we hear from a wide range of people. Finally, from me, just to take you quickly through some of the things that we've learned about the public mood from our coronavirus diaries work and, and other research that we've done. So firstly, and I think probably unsurprisingly to, to all of us, but the situation is beginning to feel pretty endless to people. Normality feels like it's a long way off what we've seen in, in quite a bit of our stuff is that people aren't feeling that hopeful that the lockdown will end in a, in a serious way uh, for quite some time. Secondly, government approval ratings are actually still holding relatively steady, even in the context of some fairly negative media coverage. Uh, some of the reasons behind that seem to be that people are resistant to criticism of the government in a context where they have really no choice but to trust what the government's saying, uh, but also a tendency that in quite a negative time, people are, would like to focus on the positives, so how things are improving as opposed to how things are getting worse. And finally, I think that lockdown is having a significant toll on the public's mental health. Concern about the future or anxiety about the future is being raised by many. Uh, as, as something that's worrying them and having a negative impact on their mental health. Technology plays obviously a really key role in this and it's a double-edged sword. On the one hand, technology is really enabling people to stay in touch with those who they don't live with, friends, family, etc. But equally, some people feel that it's quite overwhelming and it can be difficult to kind of switch off in that context. So technology is playing a really key role, but not always positive, but often keeping people in touch. Um, so I'll hand over to Catherine now, so I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. Hello, and let me just get my screen up to you, and hopefully this will work. Thank you. And well, thank you both Cordelia and Max um, and the whole of the Britain Thinks team who've really been such thoughtful research partners on this. Um, and thanks also to our funders who made it possible. So the Department for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport, the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation, the Scottish Government, Innovate UK, British Computing Society, PwC and Bulb, who all supported this work. And I think that long list really demonstrates just what a breadth of interest there is in the research and final thanks to our advisory board who who provide who provided invaluable wisdom throughout this um so i let's get the slides back let's see here we go i am catherine miller i'm interim ceo of dot everyone i'm going to talk you through um the key points of the research and the recommendations we've made as a result Please do follow the conversation on Twitter. Our handles are there. The hashtag is PeoplePowerTech, and we will continue the conversation on Twitter after the end of this event. Dot Everyone began its People Power and Technology research um, two years ago, and, and since we did those first reports um, on digital attitudes and understanding in 2018, the world has really transformed enormously. And we've had two years of 
of tech lash, of negative headlines about particularly the big tech companies. But we've also had a new regulation, GDPR has come into force in, in the past two years. And we've also had a whole load of new technologies enter our lives. So things like Alexa, Nest, Fitbit, these were all quite exotic uh, when we did our research two years ago, and they've uh, become relatively commonplace now. So the work this uh, year in this report is divided into three themes. Um, the first is about how do we unlock the benefits of technology for everyone. The second is about closing the huge gap in digital understanding that we discovered in, in our 2018 research. And the third is about building accountability so that people can uh, really be able to influence and shape their experiences of technology. On, on that first theme, unlocking the benefits of technology for everyone, it's really important to stress in this research, people like technology. So I know a lot of the, the sort of headline figures that can come out of this will be about the negatives, but the overwhelming feeling is that people like technology. So 81% of people feel the internet has made life better for people like them, 58% that it's had a positive impact on society overall. Um, and it's interesting to see that, that that gap between the benefits to the individual and the benefits to society is persisting um, but for, in that two year period. But particularly in those focus groups that as Max mentioned happened just after lockdown took place, it was almost like um, lockdown heightened people's awareness of, of what an enabler technology can be. Um, and, and really sort of brought home the ability to stay in touch with people, to get into information and, and that you know, critical ability to be able to continue to work and study through the lockdown. However, people feel very strongly that the tech sector is not regulated enough. So 58% uh, of the public feel the tech sector is regulated too little. Um, and interestingly, when we delved deeper into that, people are willing to accept the trade-offs that regulation would bring. So 59% were prepared to see limitations on, on the content that they would be able to view in return for regulation. 64% were prepared to accept a reduction in innovation and consumer choice as a result. The second point around uh, uh, closing the understanding gap. So digital understanding is not about technical know-how. It's about adapting to questioning, shaping how technology changes our lives. And uh, in 2018, it was quite striking how little people understood about the underpinning workings of technology. This year, we focused specifically on people's understanding of the sort of data transaction that underlies a lot of technology and found that really that awareness is growing. So People have a good, good understanding now of the ways that technology, uh, that data is collected and used during their online activities. But what you see there is, if you, as you look to the end of that, um, of those bars, is that it's a game of catch up. So uh, on the left, you've got activities like searching for products, products and services that I buy, information that I've shared. People get that now. But then when you look at new, new applications of technology like biometrics, technology in the workplace, people's understanding of that is really lagging behind. What's frustrating though, from our point of view, is to see how although understanding has grown, that is not enabling people to shape their online experiences. So people get how it works, but then can't act on that information. 94% of people, for example, say it's important to know what a company does with their, with their personal data, but only 25% can actually get the, any of that information. And we found in conversations, people were saying, yes, they did try and do things like change their privacy settings or, or um, expand their social media feed, but those kind of actions are very cumbersome and it's hard for people to know whether those are effective. And that sort of feeds into a sense of, of uh, resignation and disempowerment, which is very well illustrated when you look at people's attitudes towards terms and conditions, where the people say they either have no choice, 47%, or 
or that 45% saying there's no point reading terms and conditions because companies would do what they wanted anyway. So finally, around accountability, um, there's high levels of concern about the potential negative impacts of technology. And that's both around the kind of experiences that people might have in their everyday lives. So online scams being a very common experience that people told us about, but also still significant levels of concerns around the more kind of the broader sort of perhaps ethical issues um, artificial intelligence, facial recognition, for example. Um, and when we had discussions with people, it was interesting, even though we, we saw, as, as we mentioned at the beginning, that appreciation of technology in lockdown, also a sense of the potential downsides. So um, how misinformation, conspiracy theories um, could be amplified in lockdown. And also, as Max mentioned, that sense of being a bit overwhelmed by this being plunged into um, so much technology at once. What's really troubling though is, is that when things do go wrong, people really have uh, very little recourse. So over a quarter of the public have reported a problem online, but found that nothing happened as a result. And it's worth bearing in mind that a third of people had already said that they didn't even know where to turn in the first place. And that, unsurprisingly, uh, correlates to a, a real lack of trust with uh, less than a fifth of people feeling that tech companies design their products and services with people's best interests in mind. So the recommendations we've made in our report are all drawn from Dot Everyone's portfolio of research and also a very intensive engagement that we've had over the past couple of years both with policy makers and with the tech industry. And, and they correlate to, the, they, they align to the, the three areas I've laid out. Firstly, we call for an office for responsible technology. So in the two years since our previous work, there's been a real mushrooming of different policy initiatives. Um, you know, the, the online harms bill, the age appropriate design code, uh, the Competition Markets Authority have had a report. People who work in this field um, are, are kind of exhausted by the range of proposals and consultations that are going on. But what we see is that it's not translating into impact and tangible change on people's lives. Um, we think there needs to be an urgent, coordinated, concerted effort to drive regulation that's fit for the digital age. We want tech companies to design for people to both be able to understand how their technologies work, but also to control how those technologies work. This is something that doesn't need to wait for regulation. This is something tech companies can start doing now and should start doing now. Design patterns exist already that can be easily put into place. Um, and we're also working alongside the Center for Data Ethics and Innovation to investigate in a bit more depth what some of those design patterns could, yeah, could be expanded into. But we do think that for the online platforms where people spend most of their lives, um, that the Competition Markets Authority, alongside the Information Commissioner, should be enforcing these kind of standards. And finally, people must be able to get accessible and straightforward redress. Again, it's something that companies can do now, but we would also ask the new online harms regulator to um, pr provide oversight and accountability for that. And we've published separately our recommendations for, for better redress and the seven principles of better redress that go alongside that. So that is at a very high level, what you can read more about in the report, but um, I pass back to Cordelia to continue the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Catherine, for that brilliant overview of such fascinating research findings. It's worth saying that there was so much data. I think it was quite hard to narrow it down to uh, what, what's in the report. There is so much extra data um, that's behind uh, those very interesting findings. Um, so let's hear firstly from Tabitha Goldstab, who, uh, just to remind you, is co-founder of COGX and chair of the AI Council. Um, on her key reflections, observations uh, of those research findings, in particular their implications for the industry. Tabitha, I'm going to give you two minutes and I'm going to be quite bossy and strict and cut you off if you go significantly over that. Over to you, Tabitha. 
I'm all for bossy. That's great. Um, can you hear me and see me? Yes. Oh, excellent. I can't see myself. So um, uh, thank you for asking me to join you today, uh, Catherine and, and, um, and Cordelia. The report, again, is, is just brilliant. Uh, it's a really helpful roadmap for, for business to follow. Um, time and time again, I hear people asking for advice because they realize, they realize now, more so than even than they did last year um, and the year before, that the tech sector needs to change. So it's really important that we have reports like yours. I'm an eternal optimist. I'm one of those people um, on your first slide that just like technology. Um, and that doesn't always put me in good stead in these conversations. Um, but it makes me feel like as the optimist of the group, I should talk a little bit about some of the silver linings that I can see coming from the current coronavirus crisis. Of course, there's huge devastation. But if we could capture some of these silver linings, I think there is some interesting uh, opportunities for the tech industry. For example, what if we could uh, really catalyze um, uh, some serious funding going towards the digital divide? And then maybe uh, we could actually start to change some of the public's perception of technology as, um, as, as seen as a force for fighting the virus, not just as more social media or more, more, more taking their data. Um, but regardless of that, I think we have we have a long way to go and, and reading your report, bits of my optimism would lag. And, and I think reading the, the sentence where it says, half believe that it's just part and parcel of being online, um, that someone's gonna cheat or harm them in some way. It, that, that, really up, uh, that really upsets me because I tried to think uh, about whether or not that is more or less than how you would feel in every day, walking around offline, doing business offline. And I think, it's pretty clear that that's higher than what you would genuinely feel offline. Um, and the business tech sector really knows that they have to make a, make a shift if they're going to keep the public on board. And as you found, I think the, the, the challenge is this, is this um, being so resigned to bad experiences. It's like, yeah, we'll prioritize this convenience or I'd rather have fun, uh, you know, my safety, my, pri my privacy, yeah, it doesn't really matter. And I think that feeling is, is what we need to tackle. And you had two recommendations in the report that I really liked. One was that tech companies need to meet people where they're at and embed ways to act in products. And the second was to enhance rather than detract from the current online experience. And I think that those two recommendations really play directly into um, the tech company's uh, key reasons for being. I mean, they are the best at gamifying products. They, you know, their USP is knowing how to get people to do stuff. And what we now need to do, and Dot Everyone, I think you've done a really good job of this, is start demanding that they use that skill <laughs> and they use their product managers and their beautiful illustrators to, um, to focus on the reporting process and the, the feedback loops uh, rather than just the, the you know, the, the, the purchasing loops. Tabitha, uh, I'll ask you to wrap up. Oh, perfect. Well, the last <laughs> thing I wanted to flag was that I loved the, the other recommendation around a call for the digitally capable super complainants, because I wanted to just say I am totally up for being one of those. And I think that you've got here at least 180 people on your, on your, on your session now who would probably sign up as, as that. And we must demand for more collective action. Um, and I'm really excited to be part of this. So thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tabitha. I'd now like to hand over to Roger, Chair of the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation, to share his two minutes um, of observations on the research findings. Over to you, Roger. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I, I Hopefully you can... Uh, See me? Do you need me to start my video? Okay, um, that's pretty good. Um, so yes, uh, very much welcome the report uh, and delighted to have been, uh, you know, one of the many organisations that supported this work because I think it is enormously important uh, uh, having this independent uh, assessment of what the public feel about uh, where we're going with with technology. Um, Reassuringly, it's very, it's very, very much in line with the the findings from the work that the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation did on targeting and, and published earlier this year, which again found that people value 
really that understand why this is useful. They do think that these technologies are beneficial, but they 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 recognise the harms. They do not trust that companies will address this without some kind of regulatory intervention to make it happen. And they would like more control. They'd like more personal control over over what, what's happening. Um, and uh, so also, uh, you know, delighted that we are uh, work, uh, working further with um, uh, with Dot Everyone on this issue around how how we uh, set standards for what it means to give people some degree of, of meaningful control. Because as, as in this report, we also found a, a very high degree of frustration at, um, at, at, at the ways that people were supposedly being given control and which were felt not to really to meet their needs. Um, the the uh, I, I do think it's encouraging that we are seeing levels of understanding uh, rise. Although you know it's just still interesting to note, you know, eighty percent of people think that data is used to target ads at them. Um, you know, that's that's good, but obviously it is also quite surprising in some ways that one in five people don't think uh, or that, or are not sort of picking that out as being what what data is being used for. And and um, equally the other end, I was slightly unsure what to make of of one in four people thinking that. If they're, if they're thinking about companies that the data being collected is is to enable the government to uh, monitor them but but the overall we are seeing uh, improved levels of understanding and that is is really important and, and in part reflects this 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 sort of work and this raising people's awareness um, there were there were a couple of other things I thought might be worth touching upon one of which was uh, in relation to um, particularly the current environment we're in at the moment the first was when in, in, in the work we did around targeting, there was also this sense that um, because of a lack of trust sometimes in these technologies, they weren't used as fully as they could be to help people. And when we think about um, where we are right now, the impact of uh, uh, isolation on people's mental health, one of the things that came up uh, was, was the degree to which we can use these technologies, we can use uh, digital systems to support people in the, at these times. And you, you've talked about how people are using digital technology to, to, um, to, to maintain social contact with others. But the, the, the question as to how well health services, and um, for example, mental health services can use digital technology to support people is an interesting question. Um, the other area that's worthy of, of you know just further reflection is that the level of mistrust uh, that has grown up around technology because of, of the failure to address harm one of the, the degree to which one of the knock-on consequences of that is that we are less ready or able or trusting of technology where it could be helpful and when we look at some of the work going on around uh, developing contact tracing apps which most countries are you know, most you know, sorry, not most countries. A, a large number of countries are currently um, developing and, and looking at. One of the issues that we face there is a, uh, a you know an understandable um, uh, uncertainty amongst the public as to whether this is something they should trust or not. And I think that reflects uh, a lot of the issues that you have identified in this report. So, You're thank you very much. Oh, perfect. You're already wrapping up. <laughs> Being a bossy out of turn. Thank you so much, Roger, for that brilliant response. I should also say, I should also say thank you so much to all of you for asking such brilliant questions. We've had a huge number now come through. I should say you're allowed to ask short questions. Everyone has asked quite long, very thoughtful questions, which is great. Um, I might have to distill some of them slightly, so please do keep those questions coming. We might not be able to answer them all today, but the conversation when it ends at uh, quarter two, we'll be moving on to Twitter from here. Um, so let's go to our panel to talk through some of the questions that you've been asking. So many fantastic questions. Um, and there's a thumbs up function which has enabled some questions to rise to the top um, of being as being uh, particularly interesting to lots of the participants. So uh, I think quite a few people have been struck by some of the population differences. So there are a couple of questions that seem to be related to this. Uh, one question um, in terms of the research methodology, I think, was about whether respondents could self-select for race, as this is important, particularly thinking about things like AI potentially disproportionately being used to police minorities. But then there was also a broader question along the same theme of asking about some of the class differences that the research touched on. And, and the question here was, is that because algorithms 
might discriminate disproportionately against people of colour or poorer people. So those are a couple of questions from Temi and Andre um, rolled into one. Catherine, can I go to you first on that question? Yeah, so um, I may need to defer to, to Max on this a little bit for the detail, but um, we looked at, at the sort of a range of standard demographic um, factors as well as looking at sort of uh, what we called frequent and less frequent users so basically looking at, at the the kinds of technologies and familiarity that people had with with different kinds of technology I think um, to the point first around uh, race and the experience of minority groups in relationship to the technology the most striking uh, sort of sign significant difference um, on people from black minority ethnic backgrounds was that they had a greater tendency to believe that data was being collected to monitor them by the government. Um, beyond that, I think there were small um, differences in, in a number of questions, but I think that was the one which I, I find most striking. And I think particularly is of interest in relation to looking at the, the contact tracing app and particularly whether certain groups in society would feel comfortable making use of that, of that technology. The question around um, so richer and poorer groups, I mean, I, I think there's a number of factors here, but I, I think overall for those of us who sort of observe the impact of technology on society, the growth of, or, or the rise of digital technologies has taken place alongside a growth in inequalities. And, and one of the things that I think is very important that we research more deeply and understand more deeply is exactly the intersection between those two phenomena and to what extent digital technologies really do exacerbate um, economic inequalities. But I think what you see at the moment, really worryingly in uh, the response to the pandemic, is that people who are already most disadvantaged are getting the least benefit out of digital technologies in addressing the pandemic because people in, in uh, lower paying jobs cannot rely on digital technologies to keep on working and are out um, physically working and being put at greater risk than people in the sort of knowledge economy who can continue to work remotely. Great. Um, we've had a number of really interesting questions about regulation. Lots here that I'm going to try and fold into a couple of mega questions. Um, so a, a really interesting observation early on that this period is likely to encourage much more virtual working in the long term. Does this give more power to the large tech companies or tech companies in general? What does that mean for regulation? We had a really exciting uh, a nice question was which was what regulation is being worked on that you're excited about at the moment um, and um, there was also a question about to what extent regulation can take into account that these are often big multinational companies operating across borders and the sort of different regimes involved uh, might be affecting how those companies um, behave so a few uh, big questions about regulation there uh, rolled into one uh, Roger do you want to come in on that Yes. Um, yes. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, very interesting questions. Um, I mean, in terms of where regulation is going, I mean, we set out a, 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 a number of recommendations as to where the new online harms regulator could, could particularly focus. Um, and there are some areas that I think uh, actually we, that we can make kind of relatively rapid progress. So, for example, in terms of particularly issues around bias and advertising, um, the notion that opportunity ads, so ads for jobs, ads for, say, accommodation, ads for credit, these kinds of advertisements should be formed part of regulated ad libraries so that people have information and can see if these are being in some way uh, disproportionately targeted towards different groups. And this is something that can happen quite inadvertently, but just because of the way the systems work, you find that you are operating a, a biased advertising system. Um, an area that we do think needs a, a lot of work and development is the powers of the regulator to actually access systems and understand whether the harms that people are concerned about are, are, are real or not. Um, and so particularly around, uh, I noticed that the top of your list of harms was the targeting of inappropriate content to children which again was something that you know, we found very similar, you know, the sense that vulnerable people could be exploited and children were in that category, but people who are vulnerable and could be exploited by these technologies. 
And one of the problems in regulating that is because often what we're talking about here is automated systems of deciding how to distribute content is how will a regulator, uh, you know, if they receive assurances from organizations that they are not doing that, how are they actually going to know whether this is true or not? And what mechanisms and what skills and what capacity do they, do they need to have to be able to do this without invading people's privacy? So that is a real challenge. I think it's a very exciting challenge. I think it opens up enormous opportunities in many ways for us to better understand because one way we can think of these large platforms is as it were a sort of a, a that they are part of the fabric of our society now and the way they operate depends on our collective behavior and interacting with them uh, and yet we don't really have very good mechanisms for understanding how we are shaping our own society and, and I think the regulator will play a role in trying to help us get a better grip on this but they do need to have the right powers and capacities to do that. Um, on this point about multinational companies, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm less uh, pessimistic than some people. I do think you know, companies will obey the law within countries, and if we set up a law and we say there will be a regulator and you need to comply with these laws, they, you know, broadly speaking, that, that is what will happen. But we do see this tension. I mean, very clearly this tension has come out most recently. Again, I'm going to refer to what's going on with the, with the epidemic and the desires of governments to use digital technology and in particular to use phones to support contact tracing that you have Apple and Google setting up a, a particular standard or way of operating and then you have governments such as the French government saying well that the way you've designed designed this is going to specifically prevent us from doing what we want to do and there is a real tension there because this is this goes down to the operating system on which these phones work and there is, you know, it's, it's not impossible to have, you know, variation between countries, but it's pretty difficult to have variation between countries in, 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 these, in these kind of very fundamental questions. And so there is, you know, that was, I thought, a very interesting example of that tension in, in real life. Okay, fantastic. Um, let's think a little bit about the industry perspective on this. We've had some great questions about some of that kind of industry angle. A very recent question from someone who's anonymous saying, what can or should uh, non-tech uh, companies be doing to help close the digital divide? Someone else has asked about how the technology sector can uh, build trust, how it can communicate to build trust. Another quite specific question that we had really early on, which was very interesting, uh, building on the finding from the research that 43% of people deliberately give incorrect information is that a good figure or a bad figure? Is that too high or too low? Tabitha, can I come to you to answer those questions all balled into one? Um, I'll give it a go. I, um, I really like the question about percentage of, of whether or not um, us, us trying to game the system uh, was high or low. I personally thought it was quite low, um, but I think we we'll probably all do because we're the kinds of people who might be give, putting in the wrong data. Whereas, um, uh, whereas if you are, if you're not used to understanding the concept of if you give the wrong data, then it's actually quite a low figure. Um, in terms of um, building trust, I think, um, as I said before, the products just need to get uh, get better designed in order for um, for uh, easier recourse. But actually, I think. Uh, Nora Neal is one of my favorite people in terms of trust. And if you haven't read anything from her, I would definitely um, Google her speeches. She talks about being trustworthy rather than demanding trust. And uh, I think that the tech companies that go down the route of ensuring that they are trustworthy and transparent rather than just sit there saying, trust us, trust us, trust us, are going to have a better, a better chance at being therefore trusted. And I think it comes down to um, how much they're able to communicate what changes they're making. Uh, and, and I think as Roger said, the, the, um, the regulation, you know, they have to stick to the law. Um, and they, we've seen that they do, they just find other, they find ways to, um, to make it a pretty bleak, muddy pond as to how they're doing it. Um, and so I think actually being more transparent and making it kind of sexy and fun to go through the terms and conditions might be an interesting, an interesting way of looking at it. Um, then, then the question around how do non-tech companies close the digital divide, I don't think it's actually there. I don't think it, the, the, the owner should be on them. The owner needs now to be on governments and other businesses that are uh, digitally savvy to support the non-tech the, the, the non companies. Um, my hope is that because we are now um, 
have a schism that means even more people will only be able to get services online that there then therefore puts more money into uh this this area because otherwise it's it could only possibly get worse if we if we ask the non-tech companies hey what are you doing about closing the digital divide it's a ridiculous question um we need to go and ask the the really really good the really 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 savvy companies um instead and i think their job has got to be putting money into hardware so kids have got machines putting money into um into into software as well but really it's 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 an energy and a, and a money thing Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tabitha. I'm super conscious of the time and that we promised we wouldn't overrun. So I'm going to come to Catherine for one last question before we uh, wrap up. But there are so many fantastic questions we haven't fully got to. So we will transfer the conversation um, onto Twitter. Uh, there was just one really interesting question, Catherine, I thought you might want to end on, uh, which is a question about what Dot Everyone's role is as part of this. What, what is Dot Everyone's role as a mediator between policy makers and technology and the public, which was a question that I've adapted slightly from, from Alice. Would you mind just sharing your sort of closing thoughts on that question, Catherine? I think it's really important to join up the conversations between uh, policy and industry and the public. And that's very much at the heart of what Dot Everyone does. And, and our mission really is, our mission is better tech for everyone. And the everyone has to be at the heart of that. Um, but I think what, one of the things that has struck me most in, in my time doing this work, and so, you know, my background is, is in policy. And so initially I found tech people absolutely terrifying and you know the, the idea of going and talking to an engineer about their work just just filled me with horror and i only discovered sort of halfway through a year of, of doing it that they feel the same about policy people too um, and that that policy people are equally terrifying to engineers and the poor public is not even in this conversation. So I think one of the things we always try and do at Dot Everyone is speak very clearly um, in a way that brings these different uh, groups together because everyone is part of the solution of getting better tech that, that is good for, for people and for communities um, and for society overall. And so I, I think and as long as people are having conversations in silos, we will not make progress. It's absolutely vital that we bring those conversations together. Fantastic. What a brilliant place to end the key part of our discussion today. But the conversation is by no means over. Thank you so much to all of our fantastic panelists for their brilliant contributions today. And thank you so much to all of you for such brilliant questions. We tried to touch on as many as we possibly could. A few have been answered uh, in writing rather than verbally as we've had so many to get through. Uh, we have logged the ones that we haven't quite touched on today and we'll be moving across to Twitter now um, to answer those questions in more detail. Um, so the Dot Everyone and Britain Thinks Twitter handles are very easy to find. It's at Dot Everyone and at Britain Thinks. So hopefully you can join us uh, with the conversation across the afternoon. But thank you so much everyone for your time for such a brilliant discussion today. Thank you.